Hello everyone. <laughs> Third attempt. <laughs> We've had some technical difficulties starting this video, so hopefully we're good now. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm with Dr. Sahovich from Authentic Plastic Surgery, and we have been going through our series of conversations with him, talking about um, after an initial breast cancer diagnosis, things to consider, questions that you'll want to ask, or you know, dealing with your stresses um, regarding that diagnosis. And then moving into the different types of treatment and surgery options that are out there. Um, and then we talked about reconstructive, the different types of options and how that's even changed in the last couple of years. Um, and then lastly, um, last week we talked about post-surgery care. The, um, you know, all the things you need to consider, um, including wearing a good post-surgical bra like the Heart and Core bra. I had to put in my plug there. And um, so now today we want to talk more about um, two things. One, we want to talk about the difference between a bilateral and uni unilateral mastectomy and when um, just kind of the options and understanding of um, both of those and um, things to consider when you're looking at if you're of a unilateral, would you rather get a bilateral mastectomy? Um, so we're going to discuss that and then also discuss um, aftercare, just getting back into the regular everyday life and what that means as well for you and what thing, you, things you need to consider as well for that or for your loved one. So um, thank you for being here today, Dr. Sowich. Thank you. And I'll go ahead and let you start. Well, <clears throat> we briefly mentioned this, but um, there always comes up in the news periodically this question about whenever to do both sides mastectomy, mm -hmm. even though only one side is indicated. Correct. Yeah. And I would actually go further than that to say that even patients whose recommendation uh, solely includes um, lumpectomy and radiation frequently return for additional consultation because they want to know if mastectomy simply is a better option. And we sort of touched on that. For mm -hmm. example, it may avoid radiation. But they even come back and ask whenever they should just take care of this whole issue, as they put it or just take care of the breast risk by mm -hmm. doing both mastectomies at the same time and then do reconstruction at the same time. Mm -hmm. And again, it, sometimes it becomes more sensational when a famous actress chooses to do so, but that all, those are, in my opinion, very real questions that uh, cause a lot of stress to uh, many patients. Absolutely. And there are extremes that is some patients literally want to do as little as possible, yep. never touch the healthy breast, even if the reconstruction does not then give a good symmetry because mm -hmm. it is hard to match a native breast and then reconstructed breast. And I think that's important for women. So I think it, a lot of women want to make sure they can look as normal and even as possible after surgery. So I can imagine that's something precisely that. talk a lot about. So what is often forgotten is that if we're doing one-sided reconstruction, I would say great majority of the cases, the other side will require some form of surgery. So okay. it, it is very difficult to simply avoid surgery on a healthy breast if you want to achieve good symmetry. And I think that's good to know. I think um, you know a lot of women wouldn't even know or think that there would be anything that would be needed to be done to a healthy breast. So this is good information for you to be sharing with us. And now <clears throat> what comes up often, not only that some surgeons, general surgeons who treat breast cancer will frequently be uh, resistant to removing any healthy tissue, which again, from a biologic and strictly scientific standpoint, makes sense. Mm -hmm. But then there is also this practical end, the day-to-day -day life afterwards. If you have one-sided mastectomy, then you could make an argument that subsequent follow-up still has to be made for the healthy breast. Okay. And there are patients who will be very stressed knowing that they already had one cancer and now every time they have subsequent mammogram and another biopsy and not only they are sensitized but also healthcare system that knows that they already had a breast cancer diagnosis, they are also sensitized in a way. Okay, that so means there's... patients with previous history of breast cancer, if they have any abnormality in their subsequent mammogram, for example, are much more likely to have additional biopsies, which increases the amount of procedures and time and appointments and so on and so forth. And then if you take it further, uh, typically there's 20, 30, 40 more years of that because that's the typical life expectancy. Mm -hmm. 
that is significant impact on just your normal lifestyle. And I think that's interesting to say. I, you know, again, I don't know if women would always think about they're only going to remove the the breast that has the cancer in it and remain, you know, have their regular um, healthy breasts, keep that. But that's really good information to consider. Is you'll still have to get mastectomy, or excuse me, you'll still have to get mammograms. Um, you'll still need to do follow up appointments. You know, like you said, for the rest of your life and there's going to be that heightened sense of um, vigilance. Yes, and making sure that any little thing they notice, they're going to want to investigate, investigate thoroughly. And, and it does definitely create more stress for you so or, or for your loved ones. So. so in general, this is a very hot topic. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, we have seen increase of women simply choosing to do bilateral mastectomy in that bigger picture, knowing mm -hmm. that that way they sort of achieve the uh, decrease of risk of future cancer and that they also can affect their lifestyle. They will achieve more even and immediate reconstruction mm -hmm. and can move on. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's plenty of good arguments as far as, for example, doing just what's necessary. And sure. again, some patients are perfectly happy with and I think that's a, again, we're not here to try to tell you what to do, obviously, but more just things to consider when making these decisions and um, knowing all, all the information and having all the facts so that you make the best decision for yourself or, again, for your loved one. And I think that's yeah. just important to get that information out there. Um, it's amazing to me how many women um, don't know all of their options. And as you have come to find, too, um, being misinformed or... Uh, being scared about something that that really was well, scared of unknown. Yes, yeah, scared and of I, unknown. And I think it's Absolutely. it somehow always seems to start with the fact that the original diagnosis time is busy, mm -hmm. and there's always shortage of time. Absolutely. And then we can move on to <laughs> sort yeah. of more on the recovery side. Yes. Yet, that yes. We were talking the returning to a normal uh, activity level, and again, this is another interesting situation. Uh, Frequently, if reconstruction is involved, then those patients are under plastic surgeon's care for many months afterwards. Mm -hmm. And we're the ones who tend to navigate the restrictions afterwards, uh, telling the patients when and how to do things. And again, there's patients who are very aggressive and want to return to things as quickly as possible, which unfortunately is not always what well, I would say it's not indicated mm -hmm. it just increases risks of complications and swelling and wound problems and things Absolutely. like that on the other hand patients who tend to be very protective maybe traumatized maybe there's depression maybe there's other stresses involved in simply having harder recovery and they become more of a sedentary for too long that's also not good mm -hmm. So I've made a point in my practice to be very specific to the patients about when and how they need to return to their normal activities. It's good to know. On the humorous yeah. side, the worst patients are the ones that tend to be runners. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> I would never be like that. And I because they have very hard, they it, have totally. no concept of taking it easy. <laughs> especially the marathon runners. But to be honest, uh, it is very important to allow the first two, three weeks pass with minimal activity, maintaining low blood pressure, again, to minimize the swelling. One of the biggest complications related to reconstruction is fluid buildup around the reconstruction area whenever it's implant or a flap. On the other hand, as soon as that risk is gone, usually at three to four weeks, then a gradual return to activity is definitely indicated. I've developed sort of a pattern where I first maintain very strict control over the activity of the patient. Mm -hmm. Remind them often about not doing housework, not mm -hmm. doing vacuuming or mm -hmm. other things that are repetitive, however light they may be. But very soon afterwards, we will talk about with my patients about returning to some form of exercise, starting mm -hmm. with walking. Uh, and then there's other things to consider. Long term, there's going to be stretching, so yoga, um, other form of therapy on a scar. Typically, scar responds the best to simply direct pressure, mm -hmm. stretching. So then massage therapy. Uh, 
again, uh, finding a massage therapist who is not afraid to work around the area of surgery mm -hmm. um, is very important, and I can certainly make those recommendations. But in general, combination of all that means that somewhere around six weeks from surgery, patient can be, effectively speaking, uh, without uh, doing activities without any restrictions. Okay. But six weeks sounds very, very long to people. Absolutely. But it's important to remember that the first two, we're really doing nothing. And I and I think that, especially being an active person myself, I know six <laughs> weeks sounds like a lifetime. But I, I do know, too, the complications of what happens, and, and have talked to you a little bit about um, what happens to women who do jump back into it too soon. Um, and, and that's with any type of surgery. You just really have to listen to what your doctor says. Um, they're doing this for good reason or telling you what to do for, for good reason and, and for your safety. Um, the last thing you want to do is um, mess anything up where you'd have to go back again and redo any surgeries surgery. and, and complications. So um, the, the consequences yes. of complications are um, significant in that if we have a complication, however not life-threatening, mm -hmm. it often means another trip to surgery. Yeah. And that's or a big deal. starting over, yeah. Which again, after investing all the risks and time, yeah, uh, it's it, it would be silly to do. Absolutely. So listen to what your doctors right. have to say. So yeah, listen to us. Post care <laughs> and after care and moving in back into your everyday life, moving slowly into that. You know, you talked before about um, having people that can help clean and a cleaning schedule. Um, you know, even the little things you said like vacuuming. I wouldn't have thought anything about that, but you said, you know, you've, you've got to really move slow and, um, you know, slowly I and gradually move walking back into is safe life. to yeah. begin with. And then after that, just talk to, to talk to us mm -hmm. and we will, as surgeons, we will tell you when it's time mm -hmm. to go. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you being here again today and, and sharing information with us. Please let us know if you have any questions. You can message us. Um, there will be a link to Dr. Sohovich's um, Facebook page as well, so you can message him or, or me or even just comment or questions below. Um, we're happy to help and be a resource for you too. So um, thank you. Until next time. Yes. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.